Your research at Columbia is in part focused on what you call cool worlds or worlds outside our solar system where temperature is sufficiently cool to allow for moons, rings, and life to form and for us humans to observe it. So can you tell me more about this idea, this place of cool worlds? Yeah, the history of discovering planets outside our solar system was really dominated by these hot planets. And that's just because of the fact they're easier to find. When the very first methods came online, these were primarily the Doppler spectroscopy method, looking for wobbling stars, um, and also the transit method. And these two both have a really strong bias towards finding these hot planets. Now, hot planets are interesting. The chemistry in their atmosphere is fascinating. It's very alien. Um, an example of one that's particularly close to my heart is Trace 2b, whose atmosphere is so dark, it's less reflective than coal. And so they have really bizarre photometric properties, yet at the same time, they resemble nothing like our own home. And so it said there's two types of astrophysicists, the astrophysicists who care about how the universe works. They want to understand the mechanics of the machinery of this universe. Why did the Big Bang happen? Why is the universe expanding? How are galaxies formed? And there's another type of astrophysicist, which perhaps um, speaks to me a little bit more. It whispers into your ear, and that is, why are we here? Are we alone? Are there others out there? And ultimately, along this journey, the hot planets aren't going to get us there. We, When we're looking for life in the universe, it seems to make perfect sense that there should be planets like our own out there, maybe even moons like our own planet around gas giants that could be habitable. And so my research has been driven by trying to find these more terraqueous globes that might resemble our own planet. So they're the ones that lurk more in the shadows in terms of how difficult it is to detect. They're much harder. They're harder for several reasons. The method we primarily use is the transit method. So this is really eclipses. As the planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some starlight. The problem with that is that not all planets pass in front of their star. They have to be aligned correctly from your line of sight. And so the further away the planet is from the star, the cooler it is, the less likely it is that you're going to get that geometric alignment. So whereas a hot Jupiter, about 1% of hot Jupiters will transit in front of their star, only about 0.5%, uh, maybe even a quarter of a percent of Earth-like planets will have the right geometry to transit. And so that makes it much, much harder for us. What's the connection between temperature of the planet and geometric alignment, the probability of geometric alignment? There's not a direct connection, but they're connected by an intermediate parameter, which is their separation from the star. So oh, the, the planet will be cooler if it's further away from the star, right. which in turn means that the probability of getting that alignment correct is going to be less. On top of that, they also transit their star less frequently. So if you go to the telescope and you want to discover a hot Jupiter, you could probably do it in a week or so because the orbital period is of order of one, two, three days. So you can actually get the full orbit two or three times over. Whereas if you want to set an Earth-like planet, you have to observe that star for three, four years. And that's actually one of the problems with uh, Kepler. Kepler was this very successful mission that NASA launched um, over a decade ago now, I think. And it discovered thousands of planets. It's still the dominant source of exoplanets that we know about. But unfortunately, it didn't last as long as we would have liked it to. It died after about 4.35 years, I think it was. And so for an Earth-like planet, that's just enough to catch four transits. And four transits was kind of seen as the minimum. But of course, the more transits you see, the easier it is to detect it because you build up signal to noise. If you see the same thing, tick, 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 the more ticks you get, the easier it is to find it. And so it was really a shame that Kepler was just at the limit of where we were expecting it to start to see Earth-like planets. And in fact, it really found zero. Zero planets that are around stars like the Sun, that orbit similar to the Earth around the Sun, and could potentially be similar to our own planet in terms of its composition. And so it's a great shame, but um, that's why it gives astronomers more to do in the future. Just to clarify, the transit method mm -hmm. is our primary way of detecting these things. And what it is, is uh, when the object passes, occludes the source of light just a tiny bit, a few pixels. And from that, we can infer something about its mass and size and distance and geometry, all, all of that. Mm -hmm. That's like trying to tell what, uh, <laughs> at a party, you can't see anything about a, a person, but you can just see by the way they occlude others. So this is the method, but yeah. is this is super far away. 
how many pixels of information do we have? Basically, how high resolution is the signal that we um, that we can get about these occlusions? You're right in your description. I, I think just to build upon that a little bit more, it might be almost like your vision is completely blurry. Like you have an extreme, you know, eye prescription, and so you can't resolve anything. Everything's just blurs, and but you can tell that something was there because it just got fainter for a short amount of time something someone passed in front of a light yeah and so that light in your eyes would just dim for a short moment now the reason we have that problem with blurriness or resolution is just because the stars are so far away i mean these are the closest stars are four light years away but most of the stars kepler looked at were thousands of light years away and so you there's absolutely no chance that the telescope can physically resolve the star or even the separation between the planet and the star is or is too small, especially for a telescope like Kepler. It's only a meter across. In principle, you can make those detections, but you need a different kind of telescope. We call that direct imaging. And direct imaging is a very exciting, distinct way of detecting planets. But it, as you can imagine, is going to be far easier to detect planets which are really far away from their star to do that because that's going to make that separation really big and then you also want the star to be really close to us so the nearest stars not only that but you would prefer that planet to be really hot because the hotter it is the brighter it is and so that tends to bias direct imaging towards planets which are in the process of forming mm -hmm. so things which have just formed the planet still got all of its primordial heat embedded within it and it's glowing we can see those quite easily but for the planets more like the earth of course they've cooled down and so we can't see that the light is pitiful compared to a newly formed planet we would like to get there with direct imaging that's the dream is to have the pale blue dot an actual photograph of it maybe even just a one pixel photograph of it but for now the entire solar system is one pixel with certainly with the transit method most other telescopes and so all you can do is see where that one pixel which contains potentially dozens of planets and the star, maybe even multiple stars, dims for a short amount of time. It dims just a little bit, and from that you can infer something. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like being a detective in the scene, right? It's very it's indirect clues yeah. of the existence of the planet. It's amazing that humans can do that. We're just looking out in these immense distances and looking, you know, if there's alien civilizations out there, like let's say one exactly like our own, or like, would we even be able to see an Earth that passes mm -hmm. in the way of its sun and slightly dims? And that's the only sign we have of that of that alien human-like civilization out there. Is it's just a little bit of a dimming? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, on the type of star we're talking about. If it is a star truly like the sun, the dip that, that causes is eighty-four parts per million. I mean, that's just it's like the same as a. Um, it's like a firefly flying in front of like a giant floodlight at a stadium or something. That's the kind of the brightness contrast that you're trying to compare to. So it's it's extremely difficult detection. And in the very, very best cases, we can get down to that. But as I said, we don't really have any true Earth analogs that have been in the exoplanet candidate yet. Unless you relax that definition, you say, it's not just doesn't have to be a star just like the sun. It could be a star that's smaller than the sun. It could be these orange dwarfs or even the red dwarf stars. And the fact those stars are smaller means that for the same size planet passing in front of it, more light is blocked out. And so a very exciting system, for example, is TRAPPIST-1, which has seven planets which are smaller than the Earth. And those are quite easily detectable, not with a space-based telescope, but even from the ground. And that's just because the star is so much smaller that the relative increase in or decrease in brightness is enhanced significantly because that smaller size. So TRAPPIST-1e, it's a planet which is in the right distance for liquid water. It has a slightly smaller size than the Earth. Um, it's about 90% the size of the Earth, about 80% the mass. And it's one of the top targets right now for potentially having life. Um, and yet it raises many questions about um, what would that environment be like? This is a star which is one eighth the mass of the sun. It's um, stars like that take a long time to come off their adolescence. Mm -hmm. When stars first form, like the sun, it takes them maybe 10, 100 million years to sort of settle in to that main sequence lifetime. But for stars like these late M dwarfs, as we call them, they can take up to a billion years or more to calm down. And during that period, they're producing huge amounts of X-rays, ultraviolet radiation that could potentially rip off the entire atmosphere. It may desiccate the planets in the system. And so even if water arrived by comets or something, 
it may have lost all that water due to this prolonged period of high activity. So we have lots of open-ended questions about these M dwarf planets, but they are the most accessible. And so in the near term, if we detect anything in terms of biosignatures, it's going to be for one of these red dwarf stars, it's not going to be a true Earth twin, as we would recognize it as having a yellow star.